redefine food equity as good food for all. It's about everyone in every zip code across the country having affordable access to healthy, high quality produce on a regular basis. We are proud to be the partner and help make PHA's vision a reality. Who doesn't like opening a box of something that's a surprise? It's like a Christmas present. It's a blessing. It's more than just a food distribution. You get a chance to really start to cultivate community. PHA helped get people into the habit of eating more fruits and vegetables. The importance of good nutrition, how it impacts mind, body, and spirit. Some neighborhoods, they call them food deserts. That doesn't mean you don't have any food, but the quality of food might not be the highest. A lot of families and communities all across the country, they just don't have the access to fresh fruits and vegetables. I like the social aspect of it. I like the social justice aspect of it. And it was very easy to implement the program. They allowed us to create something that worked for our community. My kids are now veggie snobs. They're veggie snobs! <laughs> everybody. I'm Dr. Kari Cotwright. I'm a public health researcher, registered dietitian, a wife, and a mom of three darling girls. I direct the Childhood Obesity Prevention Laboratory at the University of Georgia. I'm also a proud member of the Partnership for Healthy America's Veggies Early and Often campaign, which you'll hear more about soon. I am thrilled to welcome you to PHA's Virtual Food Equity Summit. Today's summit will focus on food equity. As a community-engaged nutrition researcher and scholar, this topic is important and deeply rooted in my work. I use health equity strategies to empower communities to thrive. Whether I'm promoting fruits and veggies or advocating for policy change, I work from a lens that recognizes each community's strengths and not their deficits. I have the privilege of working with teachers, parents, and children. I have had the joy of witnessing three and four-year-old children scream not for ice cream, but for more broccoli. Achieving equity in any manner causes us to recognize that we do not have equal opportunities and all begin at different starting points, especially in communities of color and those experiencing low wealth. To realize equity, we must balance and provide provision for these unequal starting points. Overcoming the barriers to achieving food equity is not an easy task, but we can create valuable solutions. We must empower communities with skills and resources to achieve this goal. As we reflect on communities today, I would like to begin by pausing for a moment and recognizing the tragic shooting in Buffalo over the weekend. Our hearts are full and we stand with the families of those killed with this senseless violence. We commit to doing everything in our power to stand against the hatred that led to this action and to stand for a more inclusive, equitable, and just society. Please remember the, vi the victims in Buffalo. We will pause now for a moment of silence. Thank you, everyone. We are overjoyed that you have decided to spend this time with us today. We have a great event planned for our two hours together. We will be joined by First Lady and First Lady and PHA Honorary Chair Michelle Obama and hear from food equity experts, leaders in the nutrition space, and industry innovators about how together we can create a more equitable food system. I hope you'll join our food equity movement today by clicking on the button below that says join the food equity movement. Before we get started, I would like to thank our sponsors, Mattress Firm, Keurig Dr. Pepper, and Dole for making this event possible. A bit of housekeeping as we get started. Closed captioning is available during this program. Look for the closed captioning icon button at the right corner of the box that I'm in. We'll also be sharing a recording of the entire event on PHA's website and our YouTube channel after the event, just in case you want to rewatch anything. Now, I'd like to introduce the president and CEO of A Partnership for a Healthy America, Nancy Roman. Welcome, Nancy. 
Thank you, Kari. Thank you so much for being here with us today. And it's great to be with you and have you here and great to be with everyone. I'm excited about what we have in store today. And I really want to begin by thanking the amazing team who made it all possible. This has been a really important year for PHA in ways large and small. We've partnered with 281 new companies. We added top talent to the team. We set a really bold goal to add 50 million servings of fruits and vegetables into the marketplace by 2025. And we're well on our way. In partnership with Michelle Obama, we delivered 1 million plant forward meals to families in Cleveland, Detroit, Philly, Fresno, Atlanta. We provided 18 million servings of fruits and vegetables to families in 28 cities. And we did it in a way that leaves a lifetime habit of produce consumption. Our work with 59 food banks across the country means that 14 million families are getting access to health building vegetables and other good food. And there are now 150 new vegetable based products in the marketplace for infants and toddlers, thanks to PHA's work. So this is meaningful change, but there's always so much more to do. So what's next? As we think of those on the receiving end of PHA's programs, we are always taking the long look. We're asking what happens when our program stops? I'm glad to say that the food banks who join our program will forever have healthier food inventories for those millions they serve. The moms and kids who participate in Good Food for All will forever be fans and consumers of vegetables, if they can get them. Which leads to my next and last point. We also need systems change in the marketplace. And I see two critical areas to focus on. First, a relentless focus on access to good food in every single zip code in this country. And second, we just can't lose sight of price point, even at this time when we're grappling with inflation. If it's there, but people can't afford it, it may as well not be there. So PHA will be testing the sale of quick, great for you meal kits at prices that compete with McDonald's and others fast food. And we're gonna test the sale of these kits in schools, in YMCAs, and at retail. It's such critical work. We can't achieve health equity without food equity. And we can't achieve food equity without all of you. So today we'll be releasing our defining food equity paper, the culmination of two years work. And we really hope it will drive this important conversation ahead. Thank you so much for joining. And now please meet our Vice President of Federal, State, and Municipal Partnerships, Dr. Maya Moroto. Maya, over to you. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Maya Moroto from the Partnership for a Healthier America. We're so glad you could join PHA Summit for an important conversation around food equity. So before I introduce our esteemed panel, I wanted to talk for just a few minutes about how we at PHA define food equity. So we believe we've reached food equity when every family in every zip code in America has access to good food. And what does that mean, good food? That means food that's affordable, sustainable, nutritious, high quality and culturally connected. And our work at PHA helps people access good food. And we know that it's not enough to just define food equity. It's important for us to understand the structural issues that contribute to a lack of equitable access and to listen to others' viewpoints on how to achieve food equity in partnership with public, private, and charitable food systems. And why does this really matter so much? 
it matters to us because we know there's no true equity in society without health equity. And health equity is impossible to achieve without first addressing food equity, because we all know good food is an important catalyst for good health. PHA is releasing a defining food equity paper in conjunction with this year's summit. And more, more importantly, we're convening this very conversation, the first of many to build on what we learned during the process of creating that paper. We hope that this paper will be a living document that's improved by many voices and perspectives over time. Our paper outlines three important pillars necessary to support food equity. First, a healthy food supply in the public, private, and charitable systems. Also, access to affordable, good food in all communities. And lastly, awareness, knowledge, and skills that empower people to select good foods and to quickly prepare them at home. So I am just so excited to introduce our panel of preeminent experts in food equity to discuss what we're working on together to achieve. Dr. Angela odom Jung is an associate professor and director of the Food and Nutrition Education in the Communities Program at Cornell University. Her research centers on understanding the social and structural determinants of dietary behaviors in low-income populations, including communities that are predominantly Black, Indigenous, and people of color and identifying culturally appropriate programs and policies that promote health equity, food justice, and community resilience. Dr. Odom Jung has over 20 years of experience partnering with communities to improve nutrition and health, and she has served on numerous advisory committees and boards, including the Institute of Medicine Committee to revise, revise the WIC food packages and the Council on Black Health. Dr. Odom Jung is also currently serving as the inaugural Equity Visiting Scholar at Feeding America. Dr. Priya Fielding Singh is a sociologist, ethnographer, and assistant professor of family and consumer studies at the University of Utah. Her research and writing examine issues of social, economic, and racial justice with a focus on food and nutrition equity alongside maternal and child health. Her first book, which I absolutely loved, devoured it in two days, uh, is called How the Other Half Eats, The Untold Story of Food and Inequality in America. And this book draws on years of ethnographic field research that she conducted on families' diets in the San Francisco Bay Area to reveal new pathways through which social and environmental factors drive disparities in diet and diet-related disease. Her research has been published in top sociology, public health, and medical journals, and has been featured in outlets such as the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the San Francisco Chronicle, and the Harvard Business Review. Dr. Sarah Bleich is the Director of Nutrition Security and Health Equity in the Food and Nutrition Service at the USDA. She is a policy expert and researcher who specializes in diet-related diseases, food insecurity, and racial inequality with more than 175 peer-reviewed publications. She is on leave from her post as a professor of public health policy at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, the Kennedy School of Government, and the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. Dr. Bleich also was also a White House fellow during the Obama administration, where she worked at USDA as a senior policy advisor with First Lady Michelle Obama's Let's Move initiative. And I'll also add that Sarah and I go way back. We actually went to elementary school together. So shout out to Roland Parks Public School in Baltimore, Maryland for obviously getting us both off to a great start. Um, so let's start our conversation with the, the overarching topic of food equity. So. Now that you've heard PHA's working definition of food equity, um, I'd like to hear from each of you on how your work builds on or complements this definition of food equity. So let's start with Dr. Odom Jung for this question. 
Thank you so much. And also thank you for the invitation. Uh, as you mentioned, a big focus of my work is on social, cultural, and structural factors that influence dietary behaviors and health outcomes. But I'm particularly interested in how we partner with communities to look at solutions. So that varies across the board. It can be more grassroots partners. So whether it be food pantries or community-based organizations or other government partners like uh, local WIC agencies or federally qualified health centers. So really, I don't focus on any one sector. I think it's important that we're all on board. And so when we talk about food equity or we talk about access, food is everywhere. But it's not only food, it's the resources that you need to get food. Mm. And so part of the idea and the resources that might compete with you getting food, mm. um, if you look at uh, the differences that we've had, we have improved some outcomes for everybody, but we really haven't closed those gaps. And though that's really related to structural factors. And that becomes very important and not only building individual capacity, but building capacity of communities, particularly, and again, my focus is on BIPOC and low income communities uh, to look at how they can be in the lead of solving their own issues and that they're given that, that capital, those resources to really come up with their their um, own solutions. And, and a lot of my work is around how do how do you support that? Great, thank you so much for that. It's you know really important, I think, for us to keep in mind how complex this is. It's not a sort of a simple thing. Um, so now I'll turn it to Dr. Fielding Singh. Yeah, well, thank you so much, first of all, for the invitation to be here and be in conversation with all of you. Um, the definition of food equity that you laid out and that Dr. Odoms Young further fleshed out really resonates with me and the work that I do with families and communities. And what I particularly love about these three pillars that you've shared is this recognition that the food we eat is really intimately connected to the neighborhoods that we live in and the schools we attend and the places we work. And so rather than focusing on this individual behavior change, we need to really be shifting our attention to the key structural inequities that make it really difficult for significant swaths of our society to consume a health promoting diet. Um, so I'm a sociologist and an ethnographer, which means that I spend a lot of time on the ground with families and communities, particularly those that have been traditionally marginalized, trying to understand how exactly these broader systemic inequities drive disparities in our diets and diet related disease. And through my work, you know, one thing that's become really clear to me is that I think in our discussions of food equity, we need to be rethinking and in some ways broadening what we mean when we talk about access to healthy and health promoting food. And what I mean by that is that in my research, I find that this access is, of course, geographic and it's financial and it's temporal. But broader structural inequalities that shape our lives also generate a really important psychological component to access. Access is in part about living a life with sufficient resources and social support and financial stability and security that make a nutritious diet practical and desirable and compatible with your life. Access is also about having like the cognitive and emotional bandwidth to be able to actually prioritize healthy eating. It's for instance about being able to go to sleep at night every evening knowing that there will be money for you and your kids the next day so that you're actually able to prioritize their nutrition instead of their satiation. And so one thing that I show in my work um, is that this sheer experience of living in poverty of not knowing whether you're gonna be able to make next month's rent or keep the heat on in the winter. It doesn't just make it difficult to afford or access food, though it does those things too. Um, living that close to the bone can also fundamentally shape the way that a person feels about and uses food. And I find in particular that for lower income parents who are having to raise their kids in contexts of scarcity, contexts where they have to say no to their kids all the time about so many things that children are asking for. Junk food is actually one of the few things that parents have the ability to say yes to. 
And so they can use that food to sometimes buffer their kids against scarcity, to show kids that they love and care for them, even when they also at the same time want their kids to be consuming a healthy diet. And so this is all to say that I think access, as you've laid out in this definition, is essential to food equity. And at its heart, access is structural. But the broader systemic inequities that we're talking about also drive an emotional and psychological component to, to access that I think that we need to be paying attention to and, and, and thinking about as we design practical and, and thoughtful interventions to advance food equity. Thank you so much for that. And I, that was what I loved so much about the book was that broadening of the the conversation to include those those psychological and emotional um, components that you could just see so clearly. So um, Dr. Bleich, what would you like to add? Thanks so much, Dr. Moto. It's great to be here and do want to apologize to all of you for my voice. I did lots of screaming at my daughter's soccer matches over the weekend, so I'm paying for it now. Um, but it's great to be a part of this conversation to share the stage with such impressive women. So I would say that one of my key reflections is that USDA and PHA are very closely aligned um, when it comes to this idea of food equity and um, appreciate the opportunity to reflect on your new report and our relevant work to promote and elevate nutrition security. So at USDA, we are very committed to tackling food nutrition and security. And when we say nutrition security, it's very similar to your concept of food equity. What we mean is having consistent access to healthy, safe, and affordable food. And our efforts to promote nutrition security, which we're really prioritizing right now, they build on and complement decades of work to address food security. But this concept of nutrition security that we're focused on is distinct in two ways. It recognizes that we're not all maintaining an active, healthy life, which the definition that PHA has put forward does as well. And it emphasizes taking an equity lens. And so at USDA, we're really prioritizing nutrition security in four ways. We're aiming to provide meaningful nutrition support from pregnancy to birth and beyond. We're trying to connect all Americans with healthy, safe, affordable food sources. We're developing, translating, and enacting nutrition science through partnership, and we are prioritizing equity at every step of the way. And to do all this work, we are leveraging four key equities. So we have our nutrition assistance programs, which reach tens of millions of Americans, including more than 30 million children each school day, nearly half of all infants in the U.S., and this is at about 99,000 schools and 250,000 retailers. We also have our nutrition education and promotion efforts, which total more than a billion dollars per year across all of our programs. The largest is SNAP education and with nutrition counseling. And in addition to those, our team nutrition, which is part of the child nutrition program, recently awarded about five and a half million dollars in grants to help 21 states increase local foods and school meals. Another key equity is translating the dietary guidelines for Americans through MyPlate and by broader investment research in food systems. Many of you may have seen that we posted the scientific questions for the 2025-2030 edition of the dietary guidelines for public comment and look forward to hearing thoughts on that. And then finally, another key equity that I want to mention is all the other things happening across USDA, which has so many ways that it touches food and nutrition, such as the Gus Schumacher Nutrition Incentive Program, which is known as GUSNIP. So I think one of the key things that I want to make sure I leave with you all today is that while USDA has significant equities in the space and is really trying to do a lot, we can't do this work alone. And so we're really excited to see PHA's commitment to advancing food equity and look forward to the future work where we can intersect and tackle food, nutrition, security, and advance racial equity as we move forward. Well, thank you for that. And I was, you know, of course, so delighted when USDA created your position and to see the um, strides that, that USDA is making with nutrition security and health equity is, is really quite astounding. So thank you for that for that summary. So let's turn our conversation to, we kind of touched on this in the initial question, but I love to hear each of your thoughts on some of the barriers to food equity and how communities are overcoming those barriers. So at PHA, we're very interested in asset-based solutions. So if you can, in your comments, talk about uh, why asset-based solutions are, are important, that would be great. Um, so let's start with Dr. Fielding's thing. Yeah, so I think even in the responses to the first question, so many of these barriers really came up. Um, I'd love to spend my couple minutes talking about 
One particular barrier to food equity that I think is being now tackled in a really thoughtful and innovative way by communities across the country, and that barrier is time. Um, I think in our discussions of time in the public health community for for a number of years, we've tended to focus really traditionally on the purely quantitative part of time, like how many minutes in a day a person can devote to cooking, for instance. But those conversations have also kind of obscured that time has a qualitative nature to it as well. And what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is that for that parent who works two or three jobs in the service industry, who stands on their feet all day, who comes home at the end of the day with aching legs and calloused heels, even if this person had a half hour or an hour in the evening to cook, it's also completely understandable that the last thing that they might wanna do is stand in the kitchen, potentially alone, and cook a healthy meal. And that's because the work of cooking and feeding healthy food is labor. It's hard work, it's not always fun. Your kids don't always like what you make them, I know from personal experience. Um, and we need to acknowledge that when we talk as a public health community about cooking and preparing homemade meals as, as part of the solution to food equity. Um, even if people have the time, even if we can come up with meal ideas that can be made in a half hour, we can't just expect primarily women, primarily mothers and grandmothers to silo themselves in kitchens and cook healthy meals. And I say all this because what I see happening in communities that are addressing this is actually an explicit recognition that healthy meal preparation is an act of labor and an act of love. And that for it to make sense, for it to fit into people's lives, it also has to include the things that make life worth living. Like it has to be joyful and it has to be rich culturally and it has to be socially connected. And I think that's a really asset-based approach to addressing things like time scarcity because all of those things already exist within communities, cultural traditions, social networks, joy, community resilience. Wow, I love that idea of uh, invigorating cultural traditions and multiple generations. That is that is such a an important uh, facet for us all to keep in mind. Uh, Dr. Bleich, what would you like to add? So I want to pull on threads that Angela and Priya mentioned at the in their initial comments, which is as we think about some of the key barriers to food equity at USDA, we think about it as nutrition security. I think we have to be very clear to call a spade a spade and talk about structural racism. And just for folks not familiar with that term, what it refers to is the ways in which society fosters discrimination through systems that rationalize discriminatory beliefs and justify the distribution of resources based on those beliefs, which makes it difficult for communities of color to secure quality food, education, jobs, and the list goes on. And so what that means practically is that structural racism harms health, and it does it in ways that can be described and measured and dismantled. And this is where these efforts around nutrition security, food equity, where they come in and where they can actually make a difference. So at USDA, with the direction of our secretary, Tom Vilsack, there's a very strong focus on nutrition security in response to the pandemic, in response to the administration's goals around advancing racial equity, and recognizing this strong connection between diet-related chronic conditions like diabetes and COVID mortality. And so what we know is that COVID, mortality, COVID brought health disparities and this vital need for access to healthy food right up to the forefront. And so there's one study which estimated that nearly two thirds of COVID-19 hospitalizations in the US were related to four diet-related conditions, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and heart failure. And these disparities are associated with decades of structural limitations to retail food outlets that sell healthy food, and they are rooted in systemic racism. So at USDA, we're trying to do a lot to help. And we have a lot of activities underway and we are working hard to grow new paths to promote and elevate nutrition security. So an example of something that we've already done, it's particularly focused, Dr. Murata, on your point about assets, is that we recently reevaluated the Thrifty Food Plan, and that is the basis for calculating SNAP benefits. So SNAP is a supplement or nutrition assistance program, which serves about 41 million uh, people per month. So we were directed by Congress, this was included in the 2018 Farm Bill to do this evaluation. And based on it, we increased the benefit of SNAP, the monthly benefit by 21%. 
Now, this was the first permanent increase to the purchasing power of SNAP benefits since the Thrifty Food Plan was introduced 45 years ago. And so what that essentially is doing is it is putting healthy food within reach. And this is really important because prior research found that nearly nine out of 10 SNAP participants struggled to achieve a healthy diet because the cost of healthy food was cited as the most common roadblock. And then there are a lot of other things that we have on the horizon, all in support of trying to promote nutrition security. So for example, we are updating the WIC food package with science-informed changes. We are updating school meal standards. We're also trying to support and incentivize school food operators to pursue changes even more aggressively. And we're launching the next edition of the dietary guidelines. And then the final point that I'll make is we can look to the President Biden's fiscal year 2023 budget for additional investments that arguably will be transformational. So in addition to supporting our core nutrition programs like SNAP, um, like WIC, the budget also continues the enhanced cash value benefits through 2023 for women and children in WIC. And I'm particularly excited that the budget has a nutrition security line item, and that's proposed to be $23 million. And that's gonna hopefully further our work to promote and elevate nutrition security with a focus on building and broadening our capacity to deliver effective nutrition education and promotion. Wow, it's amazing that you can be here. You are busy <laughs> with all of these amazing initiatives that uh, are coming out of USDA. Uh, so Dr. Odom Jung, what would you like to add to this? Yeah, I would actually like to pick up on both uh, comments. I think um, Sarah's comments about the the infrastructure that's needed. I think many times we think about families being able to overcome these limitations. I also uh, worked for many years as an ethnographer, uh, worked on an ethnography right after welfare reform, uh, over several years, three years after welfare reform was passed, where I was in homes, uh, in communities, understanding what families were facing. And I think one thing that's really important is to acknowledge, as we acknowledge, as Sarah talked about, acknowledging structural racism, we have to acknowledge food as a human right. We also have to acknowledge the fact that some conditions that people are living under, they're unacceptable conditions. So part of the idea of what we do now and then what's the long-term goal, I think when we think about these solutions, we have to think about infrastructure development and we have to put resources in the hands of communities to really come up with their own solutions and then how can other structures, corporate structures uh, and others support that. But the ultimate goal is really eliminating structural racism, eliminating income equality and supporting families. Um, and then it's funny, I'm talking about these big pictures. I wanna back up a little bit and talk about something small and immediate before I forget, and that's food marketing. So if you are already under duress and somebody is marketing happiness to you, or this is what's gonna satisfy your children, that's structural. Ethnic marketing, uh, unfair, you know, ethnically targeted marketing, marketing towards low-income families, is really an issue. And so some of these things are meantime, we need to have great trauma-informed nutrition education. We need to have equitable marketing of healthy foods and communities, but we also have to deal with those root causes and deal with the long-term. And I think we can work on those things together. No, I love that, just splitting it into kind of the long view and then the immediate steps as well. And that kind of really takes us into our, our last discussion uh, topic because we know that people are tuning in and listening to this panel today because they probably want to be involved in the movement towards food equity. So um, what are some steps that we can take and that people can take to make movement in this area. So, you know, how would you recommend that people connect in with the food equity space? So let's start with Dr. Blaish. Thank you. Uh, so a few thoughts here. First, I would say that while USDA is very committed to leveraging our available equities to promoting and elevate nutrition security, we cannot do it alone. We cannot solve the problem of diet-related conditions and disparities. 
Um, I also want to point out that while we have considerable resources, they are very much dwarfed by the problems that we are trying to fix. Um, and so that's that's one take home. The second is that in mid-March, Secretary Vilsack released a report which outlined USDA's actions on nutrition security. And I encourage you to read it if you haven't already. What that report tries to do is clearly define USDA's lane. And by doing so, to make it clear where others can step in and create complementary value and where we aim to maximize new or existing partnerships. So for example, not all of those who are eligible for our programs are participating. This is true for about one in two people eligible for WIC. We need our partners to lift up the value of our programs and the benefits of participating in them. And third, we look forward to working with organizations like PHA and the various organizations that you partner with to try to cultivate new and enhanced existing partnerships to make meaningful changes that promote healthy eating across the country, particularly among historically underserved communities. And I, I also want to say that one of the things that I try to make a real point of doing is to underline that while I care passionately about these programs as a professional, I also care about them personally because as a child, my family was a recipient of then food stamps. Now at SNAP, we also received WIC for a period and also had some participation in school meals. These programs matter. They are not necessarily gonna fix the problem, but they are one of our most powerful tools to help families get healthy food within reach. And we really need your help in partnering with us to figure out how do we amplify these efforts and make sure Odom's Young's point that we close the gaps that we don't want to have? Thank you. Um, so turning it over to Dr. Odom's Young, how, what would you like to add on this topic of what people can do to move things forward? I think one thing as a first step that's really important is to look within your organization and do an equity analysis. Figure out where can you leverage the work and the influence that you have to really have an impact when it comes to equity. Um, whether it be corporate or industry, or if it's you know community uh, organizations, where do you think in looking at equity, diversity, and inclusion that you can really have an impact? And part of that is disaggregating data to understand where are the gaps. Sometimes it's hard for us to think about how do we close something that we really need to have more knowledge about. So I think different structures as we engage, ethnic marketing is a good example. Are you over, you know, are you, is there some excess marketing of unhealthy food towards certain communities? Are you marketing your healthier products towards those same communities? You know, you can close that gap when you understand uh, what, you know, where, what's being targeted, who's being targeted. And I think that's with anything. It really starts with you and your organization where you have the most influence. I think the other part of that is as individuals, we all need to have a better understanding about how inequities impact society. We all lose. And I think many times we think about it's certain populations, it's us against them, and reframing to understand that we all lose. In some ways, people are like, well, what does this have to do with healthy food or nutrition security? But the structures that impact nutrition security also impact education. They impact uh, the wealth gap over-policing, all of these things are not just by chance, they're all a part of the same infrastructure. So I think it's important in our scope of influence, how do we understand the inequities better? And then how do we make even small steps to address those inequities? Thank you for that. And um, Dr. Fielding Singh, will you close us out with your thoughts on, on this topic? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I There's so much on what Dr. Bleich and Dr. Owens Young said that I, I want to pick up on. I think the way that I think about solutions and movement is both changes that we need to make to the food system related to so many issues that have been brought up around targeted marketing, around expanding universal school meals, around retail access. But 
also remembering, um, as mentioned, that addressing food equities always demands addressing broader structural inequities. And so one thing that I think all of us can be doing is advocating and fighting on federal, state, and local levels for social and public policy that advances racial, socioeconomic, and gender equity. Because when we work to dismantle structural racism, when we advocate for livable wages and affordable housing, when we fight for universal childcare and pre-K, and student loan debt cancellation and child tax credits, we're also simultaneously advocating for food equity. Because if you go to school to find yourself with hundreds of thousands of dollars in student loan debt, or if you find yourself paying more than half of your income just to keep a roof over your head or have some childcare for your children, then you're not going to be poised to be able to actually consume a health-promoting diet. You're also going to, on a very basic level, as Dr. Bleich has talked about, you're, you're going to be more likely to experience nutrition insecurity, and that's going to make it far less likely for you to be able to eat and feed your family with nutritious food. And so the point that I, I want to leave all of you with is just that let's never forget that policy efforts to achieve equity in domains like housing and education and criminal justice are not just core, but they're actually essential to our mission and our vision of food equity. Wow, thank you for that. And I just, we have a couple more minutes. If anyone wants to make closing remarks, I can, we could do like a last little lightning round, um, maybe starting with Dr. Bleich. Um, hmm, closing remarks. So, well, it's, well, first off, it's been wonderful to hear from you all, to hear your insights, to hear your thoughts. I think that we are at a moment right now where there's very strong interest in this area from the federal government. There is very strong interest from advocates, from the research community. This is a window of opportunity. So if you're interested, lean in. If you have resources to contribute, use them. If you have equities in your organization that you can help promote these issues, please push against those to make a change. But this is a time where a lot can happen. And I would urge all of you who have the ability to make changes to do so. Thank you. Dr. Odom Jung, any closing thoughts? I would say ditto. And just to add to that, look at your organization. Who are your contractors? Who are your vendors? Uh, really making sure that you have equitable policies and systems in place. So it really starts with you. It's very hard for us to advocate outside of our organizations when we really need to start to look internal. And so small changes, no change is too small as well when we think about moving towards equity. So I would say, you know, just learn as much as you can look within your infrastructure, start inside, and then move out into the community. And then who have you not partnered with? A lot of times when I look around, I'm like, who's not at the table? And so it's important that you realize and start to think about who's missing from the conversation. Because if you have other ideas at the table, it can really help move uh, your goals forward when it comes to equity and how you think about this issue. And so thank you so much. Thank you. And um, Dr. Fielding Singh, closing remarks? Yeah, Dr. Owens Young, that was your last point was exactly what I wanted to, to touch on in, in this last minute, which was that I think for all of us, whether we're in the private or the public sector, um, whether we're in a community-based organization or in academia, we need to focus on ensuring equitable representation and voice and shared power around these issues. Um, and that means of course, ensuring that people with lived experiences with things like food and nutrition and security have seats at the table, but also that that seat at the table is not just symbolic, but that it involves authentic and serious listening and being open to hearing things that are challenging or maybe um, uh, present a different viewpoint than the one that you've been trained on or thought about for a long time. Um, because I think that unless these voices and experiences of the people who actually bear the weight and the disproportionate burden of food inequities, unless those voices are prioritized and centered, 
I don't think we're actually going to be able to design effective and tailored policies and interventions that leverage the assets and resilience of communities, but also work to meet the barriers and needs that they face. So I think that's something that we can all strive for in our work, whether it's as policymakers or practitioners or researchers. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you all so much for, for joining us today. I do agree. It feels like a really a golden moment where this this topic is really at the forefront across across sectors, and um, I appreciate all the all the perspectives everyone has shared from their from their own seat. Um, so I wish we had more time. I'd love for this conversation to continue. And thank you again to Dr. Bleich, Dr. Odom Jung, and Dr. Fielding Singh for for that discussion. So as I talked about at the top of the presentation, um, this is really just the beginning. So we're, re as I said, PHA is releasing its food equity paper alongside this year's summit. Um, and you can find that on our website at ahealthieramerica.org. Um, you could also join a pledge of people that are joining the movement to committed to improving food equity in communities around the country. So as we've, we've all heard, there's work to do at every level and no step is too small. So if you're joining us today, you're, you're part of that work. Just by listening and raising your awareness to that, you're part of that work. So thank you all for joining. And you know, I hope that you will uh, join with PHA as we uh, partner to transform the food system at every level. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Carrie Cartwright to introduce our next session. Dr. Cartwright. Thanks so much to my friends and colleagues, Dr. Fielding Singh, Dr. Blige, and Dr. Odom Jung. What an insightful conversation. Hearing about how USDA is considering equity in every step of the way and the importance of acknowledging that community members are experiencing unacceptable conditions as we engage in achieving equity truly resonated with me. I hope you'll take a moment to join PHA's food equity movement now by visiting ahealthieramerica.org. One of the ways PHA is ensuring all families have access to good food is through its Good Food for All program, which provides families with 50 servings of fruits and vegetables weekly for 12 weeks. Launched in 2020 in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, PhD's excuse me, PHA's Good Food for All program provides families in need with short-term access to produce each week, laying the groundwork for long-term change. PHA does this work by working with partners to create solutions to make access affordable, to make, excuse me, to make access to affordable quality food a long-term reality for all families. The program has already brought 18 million servings of produce to over 20,000 families across 28 U.S. cities. Today, we're excited to premiere a short documentary that highlights Good, for, good Food for All's impact and how the program brings us closer to achieving food equity. Get excited. You'll be the first to see it here. So let's tune in. I thought I was signing up for a box of food, but it turned out to be a lot more. It literally changed a holiday tradition. I got reminders of back home. This is a blessing because I haven't had a pineapple in so long. Just looking at it makes you feel a little bit more at home. It teaches me about commitment. It commits me to do something. I got, I got little eyes, watch me. Partnership for a Healthier America is all about food equity. Everyone in every zip code across the country having affordable access to healthy, high quality, fresh, culturally relevant produce on a regular basis. PHA's Good Food for All program, pretty simply, was about getting 20 pounds of produce a week for 12 weeks to families around the country. All right, wow, look at this, it's so nice. Meal time is an important time in the house too. We all sit down at the table. We commit to good food. We commit to good conversation. We tell jokes and stories and hear about school. All of that is driven by the food and a lot of that food came from this program. 
Ooh, this is pretty wax. <laughs> so it was real beneficial and it satisfied my son. <laughs> he's a big boy. <laughs> when he's at home, one banana is not enough. So I can't buy 10 bunches of bananas. I notice when I eat fruits and vegetables, I sleep better, I have less health problems, I am more active. The colors of everything start looking better. Amina, do you want orange or banana? Uh, banana. Okay. I feel like my body's like, okay, I'm gonna work for you now because you are giving me the good stuff. Fresh produce. Like, I've never really did that until the pandemic when those boxes ordered me, honest to God's truth. And when it arrived, it kind of felt like Christmas because we didn't know like what we're gonna get. So there's some things that were surprises. It felt good to eat a lot of that fresh stuff. The Good Food for All program is implemented by community partners, community organizations like Top Box Foods and Urban Strategies Initiatives. Our part of it is really the people portion. So making sure that we connect with the families, get them to sign up, and then facilitate them getting access to the food every week. Every family deserves access to those high quality, nutritious, really good looking fresh produce that a lot of people in this country take for granted. If you just drive around the neighborhoods that we serve, there's very limited access to healthy, nutritious foods. Some neighborhoods, they call them food deserts. Not, that doesn't mean you don't have any food, but the quality of food might not be the highest. There's plenty of places to get fast food, fried food, things of that nature, but not as many where you can get high quality fruits and vegetables. Healthier eating is expensive, is extra expensive. And when you think about, I have $5, am I going to buy a bag of apples or am I going to buy five boxes of macaroni and cheese? What is the greater risk? And that typically means the produce is going to take the back seat. The communities that we worked with have benefited from similar iterations of things like this in the past, where they were being handed food that didn't really provide the dignity that these people deserved. We were really proud to be able to provide food that was healthy, but also what people were interested in eating. I wasn't able to work legally in the United States. So I couldn't make a lot of choices regarding on what to eat. I have to rely on programs to feed homeless or food banks. It really differentiates from other agencies. It's fresh. When they saw that first delivery, everybody was excited, told their friends. A lot of families talked about how this was part of a journey that they were already on, that something they wanted to do was to eat more produce, or to cook more in their home, or to just be healthier. We had to commit to a change in lifestyle. I didn't want my husband to have another heart attack. So the box came at a really good time when we were in the midst of like some turmoil over our food. Food became an activity and something to learn about in our house. We really tried to engage our son with cooking and learning to cook. And I think he had a lot of fun doing things with us as we were sort of learning some new foods. I didn't know what spaghetti squash was, for example. And somebody just told me, just put it in the oven and then it comes right like a spaghetti. And I did it and I was amazed. I was like, wow, I started discovering things. I think that's what really excited people was they were getting these new things, but also very familiar items as well. Do you want banana ice cream? Yes! All right, let's make banana ice cream. <laughs> Yay, banana ice cream! I want to pass what my grandmother did to my daughter. And the way I do that is by making the food that she sees me making. When you're little, you start developing what you like. And those foods, like vegetables, fruits, they are good for her. So I'm just kind of setting her up for life that I want her to know that this is what's normal. Very good. I loved it. <laughs> My son enjoyed it too. Now he's seeing what I've been telling him the whole time. You have to eat better. He's getting it now because he's seeing it. I can be a better parent by helping my daughter and me and live longer and happier and healthier. Kids see their parents doing that, they're gonna echo that. The vision is one day that a family, no matter where they are and no matter what their income is, they can walk into a store or they can have something delivered that is the same high quality level of produce through the Good Food for All program, but then they continue to have that access long after the program has ended. This is an opportunity to bridge all kinds of people and to build community around food and really expressing love through building relationships.
I could not help but smile the entire time I was watching that video. It's so inspiring to see how Good Food for All is bringing together communities and creating conversations among families about the importance of eating fresh fruits and vegetables and reducing barriers to food equity. I hope you'll join the food equity movement by visiting a healthieramerica.org so we can continue impacting families and communities all across the country with good food. Another way PHA has impacted families all across the country with good food is through the Pass the Love campaign with someone we all know and love, First Lady and PHA Honorary Chair Michelle Obama. Pass the Love has provided over one million meals to families in Cleveland, Atlanta, my hometown, Detroit, Philadelphia, and Fresno. Let me say that again, one million, one million meals to families. These meals were distributed through a meal kit program, which included high quality ingredients and recipes inspired by Netflix, Waffles and Moshi. And by the way, this show is amazing. I watch it with my daughters. But these meal kits were distributed and they enabled families to create meals that are fun, fast, easy, and affordable to cook again and again. Building community and passing the love. Here to tell us more is PHA's president and CEO, Nancy Roman, and our special guest, Mrs. Obama. But before we get into that conversation, I hope you enjoy this quick highlight reel about Past the Love. We've got a campaign called Pass the Love, uh, working with the organization of Partnership for a Healthier America. So many uh, families don't have access to fresh produce. Ultimately, what we need to do is make sure that everybody, every family, all kids have access to the fresh fruits, vegetables, nutritious, delicious food that they need to grow and thrive. For those of you who don't know, we've got this wonderful Netflix show. It's a kids' adventure food show called Waffles and Mochi. Pass the Love especially being connected to Waffles and Mochi. You've got this connection with the Netflix show where kids are watching and learning about it, and then they can actually see those ingredients come into their kitchen. So the goal is that this is a program that can engage the family and the community as well. Our goal was to get one million meal kits to families across the country. We surpassed our goal. Thanks to so many people. As you can see, I'm really excited about this. Program. Yeah, and you should be. It's 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 great. Well, first, thank you so much for your leadership in general, but also for this Pass the Love campaign. I I think it was just this time last mm -hmm. year was that it? we sat down to talk, <laughs> and at that time. Netflix was just about to launch mm -hmm. Waffles and Mochi, mm -hmm. or then brand new show, and we were kicking off the campaign. Yeah, yeah. And now a year has passed, and both were a success, so congratulations. And congratulations to you and PHA as well, Nancy. I mean, we couldn't have done that without your leadership and your efforts to organize uh, all sectors to rally around uh, this issue. So congratulations to you as well. Uh, can't believe this has been a full year, but the campaign has been a huge success. Yeah. I... Uh, and it means the world, especially in these times that we know that families are getting access to healthy meals and they're uh, being brought around the dinner table to, to share and to talk. Yeah. Very excited about what's come of the campaign. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah, the stories mm -hmm. that came in were just phenomenal yeah. from all over the country, really inspiring. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a mom in Detroit said her kids tried vegetables that they never ever would have tried without the meal kits. Mm -hmm. A grandmother said yeah. for the first time dinner for the grandkids was easy. And that's really just what we were hoping mm -hmm. that you know, not only will we get meal to pe food to people who needed it during the pandemic, but that we would really be able to accelerate the mm -hmm. cultural shift yeah. towards yeah. 
you know, eating healthy mm -hmm. food at home and, yeah. and that being more accessible for people mm -hmm. who live in under-resourced neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely right, and that was the goal, not just to pass the love, but when we launched Let's Move many, many years ago, um, when we were talking about the issue of childhood obesity, which led us to a broader conversation of food access and uh, changing the culture around eating, um, you and I both know that uh, small things like making healthy foods accessible opens up a world of opportunities. Um, when you talk about the stories that you heard uh, about you know, how surprising it is that uh, parents are finding that kids are enjoying vegetables or trying new things. I mean, we saw that uh, during my time as First Lady. I'll never forget going to uh, one of the nursery schools, one of the Bright Star nursery schools where they were, and they brought a chef in um, to give good whole meals to two and three year olds who mm -hmm. you would never think would sit around a table and eat for the menu that I shared with them was baked tilapia with fresh garden salad and grilled vegetables. And those little toddlers ate that food because it was what they knew and it mm -hmm. tasted good and it was a meal. Um, so we should never underestimate uh, what young people are willing to do if they just know about it. And if we as parents, as grandparents, give them access to these opportunities to try new things, they will embrace them, especially if they're wonderful characters like Waffles and Mochi yeah. who are urging them on. So yeah, absolutely. I love hearing those stories. Yeah, me, me too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, learning, you're, you're so right. It's just learning. You learn these things. And as you know better than anyone, PHA is a learning organization. Mm -hmm. So we do the work, that's important, but we then evaluate it, study it, learn from mm -hmm. it, and roll those learnings back yeah. in. Yeah. And some of the things that we learned this time around mm -hmm. were one, quality really matters. Absolutely. Now, coming from a food bank background, that mm -hmm. shouldn't surprise yeah. me. But the extent to which it was mm -hmm. true mm -hmm. was it just really underscored yeah. how uneven our food system is. Yeah. The second, people like eating vegetables as entrees. Don't tell them ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> but they really do. Yeah. Yeah. They like yeah. eating vegetables as entrees. Mm -hmm. And then third, wow, mm -hmm. spice turns out to be mm -hmm. so critical All right. Right. to unlocking the power of, of mm -hmm. vegetables. So. I'm wondering, of all the things we've learned together through this campaign, <laughs> what really stands out to you? Oh, I mean, I think emphasizing that um, if you give people the opportunity, they want to do the right thing. The right thing is accessible to them. I, you know, I, I won't say that that's a surprise, um, but it's something we have to continuously mm -hmm. remind ourselves of as we fight this fight. Um, you know, I grew up in households that weren't wealthy. Mm -hmm. You know, my grandmothers and grandfathers didn't have a lot of money. Um, but what they knew was how to cook, you know, yeah. and they knew how to make something out of nothing. And that usually meant a lot of vegetables, greens and black eyed peas and string beans. And so we grew up in those households and mm -hmm. there was seasoning and there was, you know, they, they brought those meals to life um, because they had access to a victory garden. Um, they had access to the, the, um, the, the, the vegetable man, the vegetable truck. So it's not that they weren't interested. It was just that, you know, with poor families, when my parents were growing up, had communities that had grocery stores and gardens and uh, neighbors found a way to get that food into their diets because it was often cheaper yeah. for them to eat that way, um, to make a big pot of stew or a big bowl of rice. You know, um, the, the notion that we would go out to a fast food restaurant, that was a luxury. Mm -hmm. You know, you did not eat fast food. You didn't do takeout. You didn't uh, drink juice from a from a, 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 a box. Um, yeah. So we come from those communities. Yeah. It's just that the lack of access, how our neighbors have, been, our neighborhoods have been turned inside out. Mm -hmm. Grocery stores have disappeared. Big box stores don't 
you know, they don't come to mm. neighborhoods like the one I grew up. Yeah. So you're reliant on the gas station. Mm -hmm. So what I know is that if we build it, they will come. Mm -hmm. uh, and we just have to mm -hmm. remind ourselves of that when private companies say, we, we, we won't be successful if we open up in these neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes yeah. some of those grocery stores decide we, we, we just can't, we can't last because it doesn't yeah. look like a certain demographic. But yeah. the truth is, is that we come from a culture where vegetables and fruits and home cooking and, and good cooking was a part of our way of being. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So mm -hmm. I'm very passionate when people are surprised yeah. because I'm not. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. just that the world has changed so much and we have to, you know, go back to our roots to what yeah. we know. Mm -hmm. And that is that eating healthy, especially when you don't have access to good yeah. health care, is the thing that's going to keep you alive. Yeah, so. absolutely. Well, you know, we are fans of the charitable food system. Yes. I know that. And of course, there's a role for government. Mm -hmm. But you know, SNAP and food banks can't do it all. No. And so you just touched on one of mm -hmm. the things I wanted to talk to you about. I'd be so interested in how you're thinking about the role the private sector can play, not just in providing mm -hmm. food, but mm -hmm. in providing the kind of food we're talking about, yeah. Yeah. high quality, super mm -hmm. convenient, and incredibly delicious. Mm -hmm. But what we talked about during my years as first lady is that you can do well and do good at the same time. Um, as we are shifting the culture and families of all economic backgrounds and races are now looking for healthy alternatives, these food manufacturers can make good things that people will buy now. Yeah. It's just that they've got to make it. You know, they've got to look at the, the product composition. They have to, you know, make sure that they're marketing uh, the healthy options to, to, to families um, and, and people will buy it. Yeah. Um, so the one thing I want to urge our food manufacturing community, the yeah. private sector, is that, you know, keep us alive. Yeah. You know, be thoughtful in what you're producing. Um, Yes, we, we will eat processed foods. We're going to eat what's available to us and what's cheap. Mm -hmm. But we need food manufacturers to take up the, the mantle yeah. um, and to help us work to change the quality of food that families are eating um, because they will buy it. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. And marketing is a big part of that, Huge. Nancy. It's yeah. like, especially with kids, we learned during the my years as first lady, You, if you put Mickey Mouse on a... A head of broccoli, children will want that yeah. too. If, yeah. if carrots could only have a marketing team around them, uh, young people would, you know, sing the song of eating a crunchy carrot. Yeah. Um, so much of what our kids eat yeah. is what they see and hear on TV, which is paid for by the private sector. Yeah. Um, people will drink water if that's what is cool. Um, yeah. And we have tried for many years to change that culture, to make healthy eating cool. But our private sector, they're the ones with the marketing and research dollars. Uh, they have the advertising budgets to change the entire face mm -hmm. of how this country and how this world eats. Yeah. Uh, so I, I continue to implore them to do the, to do the right thing. Yeah. And we have some wonderful partners mm -hmm. who have found ways to step up and be creative and, and they're making money yeah. while doing it. Absolutely. And it really can be done. They, they may have to work a little harder, but it can be done. You know, you have been so instrumental in inspiring so much from these young people. And one of the things I just want to know, across all sectors, mm -hmm. government, private sector, these entrepreneurs who talk to us, who've been inspired by your work, people who are you know, late 20s and mm -hmm. 30s, but were kids when you yeah. were doing yeah. so much work mm -hmm. in the White House. Um, what do we do to keep all this going? How do we mm. harness it? Because I feel like our generation mm -hmm. really has to leverage the passion yeah, of young yeah. people if we want to get to just what you were talking mm. about. Well, like you said, we've laid that foundation. And so the 20-somethings are, are the products of the work we did 10 years ago. Um, I, I remember meeting so a young girl. I meet them all over the place, but this one uh, told me, she said she had just read my book and she realized you're the one who started all that let's move stuff. 
She said, I, my whole cafeteria changed. I remember it. She remembered it, that it went from a lot of junk food to having delicious meals. Mm -hmm. And she said, I never realized it was you. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, she was on her way to college. And she said, the way she eats and thinks about food is, is different. So we have to remember that while we're supporting and lifting up those in their 20s, we've got to keep educating the young. Yep. You know, we have to keep reaching back because those that's when young people are open, mm -hmm. when they're in nursery school and kindergarten. That's why the school lunch program is so important. So we have to continue to lay that foundation so that generations to come just are developing a different set of habits and expectations so that by the time they're real consumers with purchasing power mm -hmm. and they're ready to sit at seats of the table, they're coming with what they've grown up with. Yeah. You know, they haven't developed the fast mm -hmm. food habit, the quick mm -hmm. as it goes habit. They understand the meaning of food in their lives. They've grown up that way. Mm -hmm. So we have to continue to make room for those leaders now to, to take up the, 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 to, to take up to use their power mm -hmm. to start working within those companies yep you know and push them to make the change that we need but we can't forget the the younger kids that are now coming up yeah you know that's why we cannot we we, we cannot stop this wave mm -hmm. we have to keep it going and in order to mm -hmm. do that we're going to continue need the support from all sectors yeah um uh, g government, um, our nonprofits, um, our charitable organizations, um, they all have to work hand in hand. Um, so we have to continue to push for that change um, yeah. and push for that in involvement. We need more partners. We need yeah. everyone involved. Yeah. Um, and we have to do things in a very big way. It's not enough to sort of do a small donation over here or, you know, while it's important to work on Pass the Love, there are many campaigns like this mm -hmm. all over the country that are not PHA driven, but we have to be partnering together so mm -hmm. that we're really maximizing um, the resources that we have. And PHA is, is taking a leadership role at that. Um, and that's something that I am grateful to you, Nancy, and to the entire uh, organization for continuing to push and to keep these conversations top of mind in all the sectors. Well, thank you so much. I want to tell you the cool thing we're doing now. And this past the love was all part of it. So. We figured out, you know, how to make these meal kits at prices that can compete with fast food, mm -hmm. and that was no small feat. Yeah, yeah. Then we put them out, and we found out people love them. Mm -hmm. The stories came in. Guess what? They love them. Guess what? They're fast. Yeah. Guess what? They do like vegetables as entrees. So now what's next for PHA is we have to find places where we can make them available for sale at prices that are less than a burger and yeah. fries or a yeah. pizza. And so we're doing three really exciting pilots. Um, one, we're piloting selling them in schools when people Excellent. pick up their children. Yes. We're partnering with YMCA mm -hmm. to try to see how about when kids pick up their kids from a program at the Y. Mm -hmm. And we just found out last week that we're gonna actually be selling them in um, Stop and Shop that's in Boston. Excellent. So we're actually going to test the mm -hmm. private sector model. And we're going to see, because mm -hmm. it is part of a culture shift. We know people yeah. love the meals, but right. now they have to be convenient enough. Mm -hmm. And that's what I mean about just, you know, working and making it a little bit harder. But we're we're super excited about learning and what's next that well, this, flowed from this campaign. This is the beauty of PHA. Mm -hmm. You all have the resources to pilot, to test mm -hmm. out these theories, to find out what's working, what isn't. And once you do, then we can yeah. step in and help ampl amplify it. So I am, again, so grateful for the creativity and the ingenuity and the, uh, uh, you know, the enthusiasm uh, that you am, am, are embracing all of these efforts and the ones to come. Uh, and I look forward to continuing our work oh. uh, for many, many years. And uh, hopefully we'll work ourselves out of a job, right? That's, <laughs> exactly. that's the goal ultimately. Well, thank you. And my very last question mm -hmm. is what's next for you? 
Oh, in general, in the world? <laughs> well, you know, I, I we, we just finished taping the second season mm -hmm. of Waffles and Mochi. Um, uh, because I believe that that culture starts where kids are, where kids and families are. Um, and, uh, you know, creating some excitement around food and getting kids curious about trying new things and doing it in a way that's fun and doesn't feel punitive. It doesn't feel um, too strict. Uh, so I'm excited that Waffles and Mochi are going to be back on the scene, um, yeah. uh, talking to kids at very young ages and rallying people around the TV to try yeah. new and wonderful re recipes. Um, and we want to continue to tell the stories of what has been successful. Uh, and I want to be a part of uplifting what's working uh, so that we can uh, expand on what's, what, what's good uh, and what's right. So, yeah. Well, it's very exciting. I can't wait to see season two. We can't <laughs> wait to learn what's working. And I just really want to thank you again for your leadership and your support. You're really an inspiration. Thank you, Nancy. Congratulations. Keep Thank up you. the great work. Thank you. Hi, here at Mattress Farm, we have over 2,300 neighborhood stores, helping more than 3 million people a year to find the right solution to their sleep needs. So our sleep experts know the importance of creating a healthier America. In collaboration with Partnership for a Healthier America, we're determined to promote community well-being and increase awareness of food equity. During the months of March, June, and October, we're encouraging our guests to visit any Mattress Firm location and to donate to PHA at checkout. In March, more than 3,000 people answered the call, resulting in over $30,000 raised in just one month. We look forward to continue to work with BHA to ensure that every family in every zip code has affordable access to healthy food. Like Partnership for a Healthier America, Mattress Firm has a long history of serving our communities. We are a purpose-driven company and we're passionate about helping people sleep well so that they live well. We know the importance of highlighting the meaningful relationship that food and sleep have on overall well-being, and we're proud to have a like-minded partner like PHA. We'll continue to emphasize the importance of healthy food and its relationship to sleep to ensure our communities thrive. much, Nancy and Michelle. How exciting. We hope you enjoyed learning more about Pass the Love and starting early to empower families to have access to good food. It's so great to see our partners like Mattress Firm stepping up to make health equity a, and wellness a reality for all families. Thank you again to Mattress Firm. When PHA began its work with food banks in 2016, its Healthy Hunger Relief Program, PHA knew that emergency food assistance was the first line of defense against hunger. PHA also knew that it was uniquely positioned to assist food banks in getting the bad food off of their shelves and good food in. This work is essential. Today, PHA's Healthy Hunger Relief Initiative reaches over 14.7 million Americans and works with a total of 59 partners who have committed to evaluating the nutritional content of over 869 million pounds of food, removing 19 million pounds of low nutrition food from their inventories and adding over 122 million pounds of healthy food. Amazing. Two of our Healthy Hunger Relief Partners are here with us today to share how they are working with us to help improve the health and well-being of the communities they serve. I am thrilled to introduce Pamela Irvine, President and CEO of Feeding Southwest Virginia, and Courtney Kennedy, Director of Nutrition at the Good Shepherd Food Bank. Let's join them now.
Courtney, it's great to have this conversation with you today to talk about um, healthy hunger relief. I'm so excited to be able to get into some of the conversation that we're about to have. And uh, this is the first time I've had an opportunity to engage with you and this type of conversation and the work we're doing together with PHA. Pamela, I am so excited to be able to engage with you and share some of the wonderful things that are happening here in Maine, but also to learn more about what you guys are doing at your food bank as well. Well, you know, today we're talking about the Healthy Hunger Index, and um, healthy hunger is is new to me. Um, you know, healthy hunger relief is something that we've really not focused on for our previous 40 years. It's always been hunger relief, trying to reach all those individuals that are food insecure in our service area. But um, this opportunity and having this conversation and going through this work and participating in the Healthy Hunger Relief Relief Index has been a way for me personally and then professionally in leading our organization into a new conversation that actually focuses on those ways that we can better serve our neighbors. Pamela, like you, Good Shepherd Food Bank here in Maine is really excited to partnership with PHA's Healthy Hunger Relief um, so that we can be a part of a collective and collaborative group of of food banks that are participating in ensuring that nutrition is a priority of the work. It is essential as we continue to do our work that we engage in this conversation, not only internally, but with our partners, and then also with the network across um, food banks across the country. Um, you know, Courtney, that's true. And um, organizationally, we've been focusing on that for the last year um, individually. And we've talked to a few, a few of our food bank peers. But however, this work through PHA and this conversation today, and then the tool that we've been using, the index tool and assessment and the report we've gotten enables us to be able to go a little deeper into those um, uh, policies and deeper into um, the work uh, strategically and programmatically and, and enabling us to find resources and partners that want to be on this journey with us. And and so just by having this conversation today, Courtney, and the great work that Good Shepherd Food Bank is doing in Maine and we're doing here in Southwest Virginia, will provide many more opportunities, I'm sure, for the future. And, and so that's what we're looking to is the future. Um, we must evolve. We know as Feeding Southwest Virginia and our new strategic plan that we're launching, we have to evolve. Our neighbors have evolved. Our communities are different. Their needs are different. And so therefore, we have to be different. Um, and so to do that, we need to um, purposely um, provide the opportunity for conversations like this, but also tools that um, justify, not just justify, but they can actually provide the appropriate information for like healthcare partners and other partners that we're looking to work with and have worked with. And I, just like you, our food bank is really vested in ensuring that we are learning and growing from other network partners that are doing this work. And, and PHA's Healthy Hunger Relief Partnership really allows us to be able to learn more, to grow more, to hear what is happening in the network, and also to be able to think more strategically internally about how we are going to move the needle when it comes to the work that we are doing. As we know, food banking has shifted. We've gone from being an emergency food to the everyday food for hundreds of thousands of Mainers in our state. And I know Southwest Virginia, you guys have become the everyday food for um, you know, so many people. It's essential for us to continue to change the narrative. Um, what once was um, emergency now is everyday food. We recognize that people who live in poverty have higher rates of chronic disease. We wanna be sure that we are setting people up for success through the food. And um, we are so excited to be able to provide the most nutritious foods possible because it allows um, people to be able to really have the foundation that they need to be able to feel successful um, within their own communities. You know, when um, we took that um, healthy, um, the healthy hunger uh, relief index, uh, you know, it was, it was pretty telling to us um, as several of our executive leadership um, 
uh, team took it, you know, and, and then we looked at the results and we went, wow, you know, we really haven't made a great impact or we haven't focused in this area enough to make a difference in our community. So, you know, looking at the assessment and we all participate in uh, capacity assessments, organizational assessments, you know, who likes to do assessments, right? <laughs> but when you when you conduct an assessment that, um, that confirms and affirms what you already know, what you're hearing, the conversations you've already had, and, and, and it just really is a stark reality when you see it in print, right? So it was a game changer for us. Um, I was excited um, about the assessment because it was the first ever healthy um, uh, food assessment we've ever done. And, and so um, and so we embraced that um, assessment and used that when we went to the table and to do our hard work for strategic planning. And I agree with you, Pamela. It's an amazing tool that is allowing us to be able to gauge where we are and celebrate those successes, but also to really put on the table maybe those places where we need to do better. And I love um, the index because there's a range that, that we can look at. There's not just one section that it's focused on. It's a variety of topics that we can break down individually and even take those individual questions or those individual um, narratives and make sure that we are building out um, ways that we can be better and improve. And what I what I love is that we have a baseline um, with the, the Healthy um, Hunger Relief Index being it's in its first year in 2021, that we are able to utilize it and expand it and grow it and, and do it organization-wide to see where we are with all staff. I'm super excited for us to really break that open and um, utilize this year as a baseline, but really looking at how we can grow as an organization. It's an amazing tool. And the best part is, is the one-on-one -on -one consultation that we, we had with PHA and, you know, I was so excited because it's not just the, the staff, our team here at Feeding Southwest Virginia, right? We know when we go into the strategic planning process or any assessment, our board is engaged. And one of the most exciting things for us after we walked through the process and we talked about how we want to strategize towards um, more healthy food, our board came up with Nourish neighbors. And we know that it takes um, the organizational staff, um, our volunteers and our partners, but also a board of directors that is willing to invest and have um, really truly embraced the mission of Nourish Neighbors. And so for us, that was exciting that that actually was, um, uh, you know, a conversation we had, but also it was um, some board members on a strategic planning team who really wanted to move forward and wanted our first statement and our mission statement to be nourish neighbors. I love it because like your food bank, our food bank has really committed to providing nutritious foods and that is embedded in our uh, mission as well. It is so important as we continue to grow and build that we continue to ensure that nutrition is a priority of this work. And PHA, the Healthy Hunger Relief Index has really provided that opportunity. And not only that, but the collaborative of the Healthy Hunger Relief um, organization, uh, uh, food banks that are committed to this work, that we get to work together and collaborate and hear these stories and, and get, to, get to learn better ways of how we can improve the work that we are doing. So what's next for you, Pamela? Well, we are uh, begin our work July the first, twenty twenty two, and we begin looking at what the uh, the needs of our neighbors are. So it's going to be client centered, which is exciting for us to you know to be able to make that turn and that adjustment, that philosophy, and and um, programmatically deploy um, opportunities to include our neighbors as well as uh, focus on uh, better foods and nutritious foods through our uh, mobile marketplace. 
Conference, which is a new launch for us last year. Uh, April was one year, and we now have uh, 26 stops that we're doing with two mobile grocery stores, and we're providing more nutritious food, and the largest percentage of food that our neighbors are purchasing through that program is actually fresh produce, um, fruits and vegetables. And we don't want to just talk about nourish neighbors externally and not take care of our staff. So we're moving into a more well-being mindset and focus on our team here as well. I believe that you can't just say it, you have to live it. I love it, Pamela. It makes me so excited to hear you talk and it just brings up all of the things that I'm so excited about. And one of the things that you mentioned is really, you know, your staff and ensuring their well-being. One of the things that Good Shepherd Food Bank has committed to in our nutrition policy is providing nutrition education to our staff, making sure that they have the foundation for themselves, better understand how they can um, make healthy food choices on their own, empowering them, making them feel empowered. But also that helps them to understand maybe why we're making tough decisions to not distribute food that they might see as valuable. Maybe it's cereal, but if it has more than 12 grams of sugar in it, We've made that commitment and decision at Good Shepherd Food Bank to not distribute it. It has too much sugar. Um, so when people see things like cereal come through the door and we're making a decision to not distribute it, then that it, they now understand, they recognize you know, what that sugar content means, not only to themselves, but also to those that we are um, sharing that food with if we do choose to distribute it. We've made tough decisions. We do not distribute candy. We do not distribute soda. We do not distribute cereal with over 12 grams of sugar. We do not distribute cookies. We do not distribute things like marshmallows. We recognize that those products are foods that don't necessarily have a lot of nutritional value. So um, we're really excited that although we're making these tough decisions, it allows us to open up space to have more nutritious foods come through our door. And like you mentioned, Pamela, I loved that you shared um, that, you're, that you've heard from your network that people really want fruits and vegetables. We learned that true, too through a surveys and surveys that we've done. They want things like fruits and vegetables. They, they want things like lean meats and proteins and low-fat dairy, um, more sustainable foods versus those foods um, that might not necessarily be as nutritious. So it's super exciting that we're able to respond to our network. And we're also able to partner with organizations because in Maine, we have a extremely large new American population. And so we're really excited to partner with organizations who can and will best meet the needs of those that they are serving through the food. Um, we don't necessarily understand as a white American, um, a variety of different cultures, maybe somebody who's Muslim and black. So we're really working with organizations and empowering them to be able to purchase things that meet the needs of those that they are serving. We understand that we have a lot further to go and the Healthy Hunger Relief Index is one of the things, one of the tools that we are using to be able to ensure that everybody across the organization has that commitment to um, help food equity. Pamela, we have so much to celebrate, don't we? It's been such an engaging conversation to hear all of the work that you guys are doing in Southwest Virginia. Um, I know you guys are going far and look forward to continuing to engage in this conversation and learn from each other as you guys embark on your journey um, and, and see how we can continue to collaborate together. Thank you, Courtney. I've enjoyed our conversation today. Um, hopefully it was helpful for all those that are listening, but also certainly it's been helpful for us to be able to share. Absolutely. Thank you, Pamela. Thanks so much for enlightening us, Pamela and Courtney. It's clear that PHA's Healthy Hunger Relief Partners, like Feeding Southwest Virginia and Good Shepherd Food Bank, who we just heard from, serve as the foundation of PHA's mission to transform the food landscape in pursuit of food equity. I hope you'll visit a healthieramerica.org to learn more about how you can join our movement to create a more equitable food landscape. PHA's Veggies Early and Often campaign is also paving the way for a healthier and more equitable food environment, particularly for our littlest eaters. As a mom of three sweet daughters, Kamara, Camille, and Cameron, this program is very near and dear to my heart. 
My little ones love to try fruits and veggies and some of their favorites are tomatoes, broccoli, carrots, and sweet potatoes. What they love most is helping me to prepare dishes in the kitchen. Here to tell us more about why it's important to raise adventurous eaters and how parents, medical professionals, educators, and leaders in the food industry can come together to accomplish this is Dr. Kofi Essel, director of the GW Culinary Medicine Program at the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Over to you, Dr. Essel. Thank you so much, Dr. Cartwright. I'm so happy to be here today. For years, traditional medical school curricula has lacked meaningful and substantial training in nutrition integration in the health care of our patients. Can you imagine one of the leading risk factors for worsening disease, morbidity, and even mortality is a poor diet? Yet it wasn't being built into our lexicon. This all came to a head when I was in my pediatrics residency training program. I remember sitting in front of my four-month-old patient and their family. I was asked a very important question. They said, Dr. Kofi, we want to make sure our baby grows up healthy. Is it time for solid foods yet? When do we start? How do we start? What do we do? I looked around the room for support, for backup, and I realized I was in this alone. I ran out to talk to my supervising docs, and they told me, kids are resilient. It's going to be okay. I said to myself, that cannot be the answer. And I knew I would have to find resources to train myself. I began to realize that my gap in knowledge around childhood nutrition and infant feeding, especially during those first thousand days of life, was consistent with most training programs around the country, and it was very worrisome. You see, those first thousand days of life from conception to the age of two are critical because the brain is growing at its most rapid rate, and it's incredibly vulnerable when it lacks the essential nutrients. During that time, if the baby's brain doesn't receive the necessary nutrients, we are not giving that child a fair chance to thrive, and we may be hindering their development. We cannot say to that child, it's fine, you're resilient, you'll catch up later. We cannot treat those initial years as forgotten years. We have to be strategic and intentional. I began to realize that this was a systemic issue. We needed to do better, and I promised myself that I wanted to be a part of a paradigm shift on how we address these topics. I truly believe that food is medicine. It is a critical part of good health care, and it deserves a chance throughout the life course of families. The reality is that in order to have a lasting and persuasive impact, there is no way that health care can do this by itself. We need a multidisciplinary, dynamic, systemic structural approach, and that's why I became involved with PHA's Veggies Early and Often campaign. As a coalition member, I am part of a cross-sector nutrition education collaborative, bringing together food manufacturers, researchers, clinicians, and early childhood educators to raise awareness about how children develop taste preferences. We want to ensure that all young eaters, no matter their background, have a fair chance to become healthy and adventurous eaters from the very start. We aspire to raise a generation of veggie lovers. Our goal is to go upstream and transform policy, improve education, and address structural barriers so we can all collectively recognize that these early years must never be forgotten. Please allow me to highlight just a few of the amazing accomplishments of this initiative. In January of 2021, PHA launched the Veggies Early and Often campaign alongside a dozen founding partners in conjunction with the release of a white paper titled, Yes, Kids Can Learn to Love Veggies. This amazing white paper highlights the simple and yet profound fact. Exposure to veggies early and often is key to raising adventurous, healthy eaters. Food industry leaders, early childhood educators, medical professionals, and yes, even our parents and caregivers can read this paper, use our graphics, and gain great insights into cutting-edge research and practical advice in early childhood feeding. The second major accomplishment of PHA's Veggies Early and Often initiative has been its partnerships to raise the bar on early childhood food offerings across the country. The marketplace has been heavily saturated with fruit-based, fruit-mixed, or even super-sweetened products that takes advantage of our innate human desire for sweet, but does very little to expand our palate to the variety and diversity of other flavors that are needed to establish healthy habits and counteract picky eating. 
Fact, veggies are critical to a healthy life. 90% of toddlers don't eat the recommended amount of vegetables per day. Guess what? 90% of adults don't eat the recommended amount of vegetables per day. We eventually want our babies to grow to consume what everyone else in the house is consuming. So you can imagine how this veggie cycle just continues on and on and on. So what is a way that we can change behaviors and make the healthy choice the easy choice? Look for the icon. That's right, we developed PHA's first ever veggies early and often icon for products and menu items. This special icon is able to be used on products that contain more than half vegetables and no additives. We are successfully working with 10 companies around the country that have adopted this icon, saturating the marketplace with over 150 products that meet PHA's highest veggies early and often icon requirements. Finally, another accomplishment I am particularly proud of is how we've hosted dozens of conversations with physicians and trainees, early childhood education professionals, and food industry leaders all around the country to talk about the important findings and implications of this research. And you know what? We're only just getting started. Ultimately, we want to ensure that in doing this great work, we are not worsening disparity. We are not worsening inequity. So we have made a decision to recognize the role of food and nutrition security in our messaging and in all of our training. We need affordable baby toddler food products with exciting, enjoyable flavors. And we need product lines with a wide variety of vegetables. We need options that don't hide but enhance the flavor of vegetables in ways that are culturally diverse and appealing. We need to help parents and caregivers give their babies the best possible start to life. We must work together to educate consumers and transform the food landscape. If your brand or organization believes and is committed to the same things as PHA, we invite you to join Veggies Early and Often. We aim to add new commitments from baby and toddler food manufacturers, as well as early childhood education providers to increase affordable and veggie forward offerings as soon as possible. Over the coming months, our team is finalizing some essential patient education materials that will be sure to enhance the clinician's ability to engage families on these important topics in early childhood feeding. And we plan on releasing these tools at one of the largest pediatric professional conferences in the country in October of 2022. I think back to my four-month-old patient, and I wish I could have done it differently. But yet, I see a future where my colleagues will have a more uniform, powerful, and collective message that recognizes the importance of veggies early and often and connects families to meaningful federal and local resources to be able to support these efforts. It is our collective responsibility to give our next generation a chance to thrive. We must not point fingers, but recognize the importance of collaborative, multidisciplinary campaigns, such as Veggies Early and Often, to centralize the family, promote health equity, and ensure that no child is forgotten. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon. I'm Peter Dolan, and I'm the chairman of Partnership for a Healthy America's Board. I'm so pleased to be with you all here today at our annual summit. Since its founding in 2010, PHA has worked with the food and beverage industry to make the healthy choice the easy choice for consumers. From the companies that make food and beverages to the ones that sell these products, PHA's partners have significantly moved the needle in providing America's families everywhere with better for you options. PHA's work has come a long way since its founding in partnership with Mrs. Obama's Let's Move initiative. We're leveraging the power of companies to transform the food landscape in pursuit of health equity. And we know that together, we can make sure that every American in every zip code has affordable access to good food. In the next phase of its journey, PHA will work with food and beverage manufacturers, retailers, and other sectors to break down the multiple barriers to food equity, including affordability, accessibility, and time that you just heard about in today's first panel. We also encourage our partners in the private sector to focus on marketing practices 
that promote healthier options. With us today are our partners from Keurig Dr. Pepper and Ahold Del Hayes USA to tell us about a project they're working on together to promote healthier beverages in under-resourced communities. I'm also pleased to introduce Stacy Molander, PHA's Chief Operating Officer, who will be leading this important conversation about how private sector companies are making an impact on food equity. Over to you, Stacy. Well, thank you, Peter. I am just delighted to host this conversation between two PHA partners today about how they are working together to use food marketing and merchandising for good. So joining me today are Andrew Archambault, Chief Customer Officer at Keurig Dr. Pepper, and Gordon Reed, President of Stop and Shop. Welcome to you both. Hello, good morning. Thank you, Stacy. Well, good morning. Great to be here. I'm glad you're here. Well, let's get right into the details. And I think Andrew may be starting with you. Um, before we talk about this particular project that you're doing with Gordon and his team, can you tell us a little bit about your commitment to PHA and how this project is an extension of that commitment? Sure, and, and thank you for hosting. It's a, it's a great initiative to be a part of. You know, we, we came together as KDP, a, a modern beverage company in July of, of 2018. And it was a large portfolio with a lot of offerings to the market. And along the way, we've made you know, several commitments. And one of those more recently is that 60% of all of our products would fit a definition of positive hydration by the year 2025. And that definition was really done in partnership with health experts, nutrition experts, and, and the PHA board to have a definition that's not just about low calorie or low sugar, but also added functionality, nutrients, and then ultimately a commitment to share where our percentage of marketing spend goes against those products and disclose that publicly. So that's our commitment over the next you know, three years. And ultimately the natural extension of that is how do you merchandise your products at retail? Because our retail partners are how we reach our end consumer. So this work and this pilot that we're doing with Stop and Shop and with Gordon and team just allow us to get closer to that, that positive hydration commitment to the marketplace. That's terrific, great. So let's get into the details specifically about the pilot. And I think if we start with the store location that's been selected, the stop and shop that's in an under-resourced area outside of Boston, because I think that's a really critical decision that both of you made. So Gordon, can you tell us a little bit about this store in the Boston area and why it was selected? No, absolutely, Stacey. So we worked in partnership with the Boston Public Health Commission and looked at rates of chronic health, such as diabetes, high blood pressure, et cetera, uh, in each of the neighborhoods of the cities in which we operate, and as well as rates of food insecurity and poverty. Um, and so when we compared the data with our store footprint, we landed on our store in the neighborhoods uh, of Grove Hall uh, to embark on this project. We all, we're already involved with the community there, and we're investing heavily in that community to give uh, help drive healthier outcomes. So we're refreshing our store, the look and feel of the store. We're adding a community wellness space. Uh, we've added Fresh Connect, which is a produce prescription service. Um, and we've also put a dietitian into the store to give advice to the local people. And we believe that as a grocery retailer, we have a commitment and a responsibility to sort of help uh, people have healthier options. So we really are so looking forward to working with uh, Keurig Dr. Pepper in this uh, marketing activity. We already work really closely with the community in Grove Hall. You know, for example, we distribute healthy foods to hundreds of locals through the, our relationship with the Dimmock Centre uh, there. Uh, and we opened a stop and shop school food pantry uh, recently where we sort of help uh, provide food for 200 uh, school children uh, so they make sure they can go home uh, and have food in the evening and in the morning before they come to school. And that way they can focus on their education and hopefully work towards a bright future. 
You know, Gordon, that responsibility you mentioned, um, I think that's a really important point, and I was glad to hear you say it, because I'm sure, as you both know, giving priority placement within a retail store to junk food is really a criticism that both retailers and beverage companies often hear. Um, and from what I understand about this particular pilot, that you're testing in-store marketing and merchandising strategies to really prioritize the placement of these better for you products. Um, you know, I think Gordon, all that you described about what you're doing in the community is absolutely terrific. But I think a lot of the criticism is what's happening inside the store. Absolutely. So I think it'd be great to, you know, get a little bit deeper into that and share with the audience specifically how KDP and Shop Stop and Shop are working together on really addressing that criticism in the store. And, and maybe Andrew, that's something you can share with us. Sure. I mean, it's I mean the point being made is that. If you have a great balanced portfolio, the question is, is it really merchandised in a way that allows consumers to have a lot of choice? And ultimately, I think this pilot and really how we go to market is about providing balanced choice. The key for us and to work with key retail partners is that you essentially move out of center store and you get to many other areas of the store that are high impact, high purchase. And that really means displays. It, it does mean the front end of store. If you just look at natural traffic patterns, center store does receive a fair amount of traffic, but not nearly as much as the perimeter. So the decisions we make around the perimeter of a store with a retailer have a big influence on, again, offering that choice. And then again, for us, it really does come down to, if we have a product portfolio that 60% fits our positive hydration definition, we can work with a partner like Stop and Shop that also has their own definition like Guiding Stars and their Guiding Star definition and our definitions line up very nicely. So there's an opportunity to just put those two definitions together around a product group and then merchandise outside of center store. And, and at the end of it, that's our goal. If we do that effectively well, then the choice and the balanced portfolio come out in front of the shopper and then the consumer and shopper make the right decision. And our goal is ultimately to delight the shopper and. And, and work well with our retail partners. So this is this is at the core what the pilot's about for us. That's great. Well, even though um, that activity sounds terrific, we're still going to have critics and skeptics in our audience, of course. And I think a lot of folks are going to be asking sort of why now? You know, this is something that's been going on in the retail setting for a while. So what what is the motivation for the two of you to come in together? And also, what's the motivation for your individual companies to to be working on this pilot now? And maybe, Gordon, we can, we can start with you. Sure. I think, um, you know, as a... It's a supermarket business and a, uh, one of the main grocers in our market. We've supported you know, food insecurity for decades and we've been there to help people in the food banks in particular. <clears throat> and as we've, so that's moved forward, we really have seen the need for not just people getting food, but getting healthy food. And that's, I think, is something for me personally, I find really important. And as a business, we really have that focus. And I think COVID has shown us that um, the food insecurity is something that's close to far more families than people realize. And the, uh, the predisposition of some of these conditions like diabetes and uh, high blood pressure, et cetera, have uh, really sort of hit some communities worse than others. And so along with our work at um, Grove Hall, this sort of a relationship that we're having with Curry Dr. Pepper to really focus on our merchandising is just perfect uh, timing. You know, So the, the assets that we have, we see the importance of working with other uh, uh, partners. We have 406 stores, we have 60,000 people, we have great relationships with our suppliers, and we believe that working together, we can really make a difference. So, you know, it's almost like the one plus one equals three, uh, because we really are building on each other's uh, uh, support. And so together we can use the power of merchandising and marketing to steer our customers toward healthier choices. And that said, we believe in giving customers a choice. So it doesn't mean to say it's going to be extreme and all or nothing uh, view, because people have a choice, but we're trying to sort of focus people onto healthy uh, products rather than maybe the sodas or other things that they would normally buy. Um, so we want to look at prominent end cap displays we're promoting in our weekly circular. And particularly at the end of the month, when some of the families there really are you know, budget conscious and may opt for lower costs of unhealthy items. And that's something that we're going to try and focus on to allow or to you know, give people options that are far healthier. 
We've also just added guiding stars ratings to our beverages at Stop and Shop this year, which will help guide these changes. So our guiding star is a rating system where products are rated with one, two or three stars based on your, their nutritional value. So star earning beverage now include water, some of the innovations in seltzers, unsweetened teas, unsweetened coffees, uh, and some of the juices and some of the great products that we're seeing from Keurig Dr. Pepper. So, you know, really, I think it's an exciting time. It's two great companies coming together. Uh, and I think when you have the same focus, we can really make a difference and learn a lot about how we can move forward in the future. That's great. You know, you met, you mentioned choice and so many times companies talk about choice and we still want to give consumers choice, but I think what I'm hearing is different here is, you know, we're going to use marketing that we know works to push them and nudge them to, to those healthier choices because there's a responsibility to do that given our public health crisis. Andrew, how about you? Why, why, is, why is KDP involved in this now and um, what is the real motivation for your company? Well, certainly, I mean, since we since we began the merger, we've increased the portfolio. So we've done it in a way where the choices that we've made on adding a portfolio have been healthy consumer choices. So in some ways, I would like to feel like we're following where the consumer wants to go. So there's certainly a business benefit to that, to merchandise what shoppers want to buy. Uh, a few that come to mind specifically, you know, buy, which is an enhanced water, was, was made as an acquisition right before our merger. We purchased core hydration. We've done long-term partnerships with, with Evian and now Polar Beverage, Sparkling Water. All of these are either low or no calorie or additional nutritional offerings. So there's no doubt that there's a, there's a business impact to, to merchandising effectively. But the more we look at it, it's, it's just also where the consumer trends are going. There's a treat occasion and those will always be valuable, but, but they aren't the only occasions. There's a lot of occasions that are about healthy choice, better for you. And the more optionality you have in your product line, the more that, that you can provide that to consumers. We need their retailer partners to work with us. It is a partnership. And what's great about this is that when you do it together with a strong retail partner, like Gordon and the Stop and Shop team, they're making decision on assets to give you the space to go put out a product portfolio that really fits the mission. It's harder to do that if you don't have one or the other. And, and ultimately it shows up by what you see on display and what you see uh, not only in the pilot stores, but as it, as it grows. And finally, what probably comes out in our IRI data and, and you know, coming back and showing the results of what changed in certain pilot stores versus others so that we can learn from it and keep expanding. But for us, to me, this, there's, there's certainly a business component, but it's just the right fit of right retail partnership against the right portfolio on the right assets that makes it look largely different than it may if it was solely a, a center store initiative or no initiative at all. Right. Well, and Andrew, you mentioned, you know, this being good for business. You also mentioned using the learnings. I think that d does beg the question, how will you measure success? Obviously, sales success is one form of success, but love to hear both from both of you on, you know, how you will measure success and equally as important, how you will use those learnings. Will you think about scaling this to other stores? Um, what does that look like? And I think maybe Gordon, we can start with you. Sure. Well, obviously, I think sales are one element, but not the most important. And I think it's going to be really getting feedback from the communities. I think getting feedback from a nutritionist that's going to be in store and understand uh, you know, what people are saying about that. And we'll look at the trends, we'll look at the, the numbers uh, and the products that are, uh, are selling. Um, and I think we'll look at sort of different mechanisms for promotions, for activities that we sort of set up. We can potentially do samplings. And you know, use that to sort of create a pro program that we can roll out in other stores and really sort of incentivize people to go to healthy choices. Um, and I think obviously sharing it with PHA is going to be key because you can then pass it on to other retailers and other uh, 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 companies. Uh, and we're happy to to do that. I think it's important and it's beholden to all of us to to move people to a, a healthier place. So. I, mean, I think it's really exciting. You know, I think that's and we're open to sharing and working with others as we go forward, and we'll we'll take this as a great learning uh, opportunity. Andrew, anything to add there? Yeah, Stacey, I just may add. I mean, I, I think I look forward to the fact when we can bring back results from this. They are measurable, right? So we'll be able to look at RI data and sales data from the stores. And to Gordon's point, not just not just on the sales side, but then what what was different in consumer behavior or shopping behavior? And how did a certain way that we might have merchandised actually 
change the way a shopper behavior or purchase was was impacted. So I think that's that's the real empirical data that we should look for. For us, that would just help us inform future category management strategy, space allocation strategy, you know, center store. I think it's an and proposition. I mean, what we would be most excited about is that there are really large portions of not only our portfolio, certainly ours, but other suppliers that have a lot of healthy choice options that again, just may not make it all the time out of center store. And if they do, um, there's no doubt that that what we've seen in other markets or other areas that that the purchase decisions change and they they tend to move towards healthier options. So I think that that'll be the outcome and and certainly we'll need some time to execute it. It comes down to execution for Gordon and I and our teams over the next several months, but we'll be able to come back with real data and real real results that we can all look at together and see what it shapes for the future. Great, and it sounds like I have a commitment for both of you to come back and share those results publicly, which would be terrific. Um, I also, you know, I heard Gordon say, using these learnings to potentially influence other food and beverage companies. And Andrew heard you say, you know, category management, which means you can also, managers rather, which means you can also influence other retailers. And I think that sort of residual impact of a pilot like this to motivate other food and beverage companies, other retailers to do something similar. I mean, that really is the catalyzing power of partnerships to really change the landscape. And, you know, at least from the PHA side, a really exciting part of the work. So I think that's a great note to wrap up on. Gordon, thank you so much for your time. Andrew, thank you so much for your time. Best of luck to you both on the pilot. And we'll be following up to hear more as soon as learnings are available. Thank you so much. Thanks Thank you, much. Stacey. Pleasure. Thank Take you, Gordon. Take care. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you so much for joining us today, everyone. To the sponsors of today's event, Mattress Firm, Cured Dr. Pepper, and Dole, thank you sincerely for enabling such an inspiring convening. To everyone that attended today's event, thank you so much for tuning in. We value you and your time, and we are so thrilled that you invested time with us to discuss the importance of achieving food equity today. You will receive an email from PHA with instructions on how to watch the summit or your favorite panel again. Please feel free to share the link with your colleagues, friends, and family too. And don't forget, please visit ahealthieramerica.org and join the food equity movement today. Together, we can ensure all families in every zip code have access to good food and the resources they need to feel empowered. We'll see you during the movement. I am Kari Cartwright, and on behalf of PHA, thank you so much for attending. Mm -hmm.